Colossians, the third chapter, verse 14. Above all these things, put on charity, agape love, the God kind of love, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. First Timothy 4, 12. Paul wrote to young Timothy and he said, Be thou an example of the believers. That word example we found means to be a model, a role model, a mold, a pattern. To be an example that others can follow. 2 Thessalonians 1.3 Paul said, we're bound to thank God always for you, brethren. Romans 1, 8, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. I thank God for your faith spoken of throughout the whole world. By the way, by satellite and communications, the faith of this house has been spoken of throughout the world even in the last few days. A lot of witness going forward from many different sources I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God given you by Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 4. Two or three more verses, 1 Corinthians 14, 18. I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than you all. Paul was not ashamed of the blessed Holy Spirit. Philippians 1, 3, Paul said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. I thank my God. Well, the references just go on and on. Second Thessalonians 2.13, but we are bound to give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. Going back to 1 Thessalonians 2.13, for this cause also, thank we God without ceasing because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it, not as the word of man, but as it is the truth, the word of God. Folks, we need examples of personal faith in God today. We need examples, patterns, role models that the world can look at and say, that's what it's all about. She is what it's all about. He is what it's all about. When everyone's falling apart, something is different about these people. I've said it quite often, and I say it again this morning. The desire of my heart is to be the most thankful minister on the face of God's earth, the most thankful pastor. Will I accomplish that? I don't know, but I'm having fun on the journey. I want to be thankful to God for every blessing, both great and small, and so help me, it seems like they're all great. And I want this church to be one of the most grateful churches on the face of this earth. The fact that we're still a church, the fact that we have a place to worship, the fact that we have a home, the fact that the storm as the song was written, could not blow, did not blow us away by the grace of God, did not blow the true church away, did not blow the school away, the Bible school, and on and on the story goes. But Paul is an example of thankfulness. Paul to me is a model. He's a role model. If there was ever a New Testament character that had the right to sour grapes, it was the Apostle Paul. I mean, one experience with Alexander the coppersmith will last you for a lifetime. I mean, this man went through prison. And in the Corinthian letter, all the listings of the things that he went through. I mean, as challenging as mission trips may be, in one way we could say they're a piece of cake compared to what Paul faced. You know, we don't like the mosquitoes. We don't like the mattress not being what we'd like for it to be. We, we don't like food that we're not a accustomed to. And, you know, we don't like a climate that is not what we're accustomed to. But folks, you know, I think if there's anything that Americans need to just rediscover, it's a spirit of thankfulness. To thank God that things are as good as they are. There's so many things that I wished could be better. But if you're not careful, you'll get caught on the treadmill of what I don't have and what I wished I had and what I have that I'm not happy about, instead of counting your blessings, and as the old song said, name them one by one. 
That will keep you busy for the rest of your life. And thank God for his goodness. Paul thanked God for his brothers in Christ, his sisters in Christ. Paul thanked God for their faith. Do you know we've seen faith exhibited in this room today? We've seen faith exhibited from someone who's just the beginning of the year gave his heart to Jesus. And to see that heart-touching innocency of faith overshadow a lifetime of sin. And to see the grace of God walk in and see Satan flee out the back door, defeated, sins under the blood, a new creation in Christ Jesus. It's what it all comes down to. This week has been a very stirring week for me. I've walked in the shadow of the valley of death with others. I've talked to people who did not know what to do about that shadow. There were misgivings. What are you going to say at that moment? All the ministry things we say, if you think you have a few moments, you fire your best shot. And it all comes back to the fact that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm not all I want to be. I'm not what I used to be, but I'm on the way to being everything that Jesus died for me to be. My sins, my faults, my failures are under the blood. My spirit, man, is strong in the Lord. And God does not hold our past against us. Some of you ought to turn card wheels on that one. God does not hold our past against us. When God sees us, he sees us through the sunglasses of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ And our glaring faults and failures dim into nothingness. It takes the harsh rays of the penalty of sin out. And no more do we have to pay for sins. No more do we have to be a slave master to the law. No more do we have to walk around with guilt and fear and condemnation. But when God looks at us, he does not see us as an old, dirty, rotten, good-for-nothing sinner. Oh, there's vast room for improvement Our minds are still under construction. Our bodies are still under construction. But oh, in my spirit, God lives big within me. And God loves me and God loves you, period. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. In a church service, you fish for all kinds of fish. You fish for those who have never made a commitment to Christ. And if for some reason someone does not have the assurance of their salvation, there could be a problem there. We don't want anyone to leave these services with a lingering problem. You need to get that problem solved that I'm born again, that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Jesus is not a denominational Jesus. Is he a Baptist? Is he a Methodist? Is he a Catholic? Is he a Lutheran? Is he a charismatic? He's all that and so much more. Jesus is Jesus And there's just one kind of believers, not just your church or someone else's church. There's just one kind of believers going to heaven. And those are the believers that are washed in the precious blood of Jesus. Paul thanked God for the church. He thanked God for the brethren. He thanked God for the sisters. He talked about the women that ministered to him. Women have always had a tremendous heart for the work of God. And Paul talked about the women that ministered and made sure that the needs of the ministry were taken care of and met. And there were those that came to Paul in prison and those that gave of their best. And he said, they came and they oft refreshed me. Kind of balances out the Alexander the coppersmiths along the way. You know, they're interesting folks. They weren't happy before they got there. They're not happy when they get there and they're not happy when they leave. Kind of a frustrating thing to not be happy. Down in the Caribbean, they said, don't worry, mon, be happy. 2 Corinthians 2.14, now thanks be unto God. Why? Well, for one reason, which always causes us to triumph. We win if we don't quit. We win if we hold steady. God causes us to win. 1 Timothy 1.12, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. Paul was just so thrilled that God had called him to be in the ministry. 
And oh, there's another one. I'm just giving you a few for instances here. Philippians 4, 6. I love the Pauline epistles. I love them. They just charge my battery. Paul taught us that we are to offer our prayers and supplications unto God with thanksgiving. You know, when we asked brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so to pray in the old days, they'd get that sad face. They'd talk about the burdens of the journey and the weariness, you know, and oh, Lord, you know. He knows all that stuff. He's tired of hearing it. We need somebody to stand up and step up to the plate and say, oh, Heavenly Father, you're a wonderful Heavenly Father. Oh, Jesus, you are Lord. I'm your partner. I'm your child washed in your blood. Welcome, Holy Spirit. What are we going to do today? Oh, God loves those kind of prayers. Put your angels to work. Some of your angels have taken early retirement. They just gave up. They said, we get tired of sitting around at the unemployment office. We want something to do. Your angels are the good friends of the people of God. Angels surround us today. Give your angel something to do. Give him a project. Don't let your angel take early retirement. Now, some of you overwork your angels. For some, they've had to call in extra forces. And, oh, Thankfulness is a sign of godliness and holiness. Holiness is not just all the things you don't do or the naughty things you did. Thankfulness is a sign of godliness. And it's also a sign of holiness. Paul, in writing to young Timothy, he was talking about the last days, and he said, in the last days, perilous times will come. And, and in that list, he said, those that will be unthankful, unholy. So when I'm all bummed out and mad at myself and mad at the world and mad at her, you know, I'm unthankful, but there's a deeper thing there. I'm unholy. Remember Israel's cardinal sin was they forgot to be thankful. Well, pastor, you don't know how bad things are. Things could be worse, my friend. I talk to people every week that things are worse. And they need to hear that God can bring them out. Thankfulness is a sign of godliness and holiness. Number two, to the extent that we are thankful, we are godly. To the extent that we are thankful, we are godly. When you're thankful, well, let's, let's go back to being parents. You know, a parent, many times I look back at the sacrifices my mom and dad made because, you know, things weren't that great many years ago, even if you had a fairly good family. Little things went a long way. Little Christmas presents went a long way. And I look back and, and I see during some very challenging times in my father's uh, early business life as an attorney, I mean, I, I, I know things that they did. When that brand new shiny red bicycle came out, it had a horn on it. It had a light on it. I mean, it had some of the, some of the things that, man, I mean, I could ride that bike and really feel like I was, you know, something in the neighborhood. But you know what? That bike cost my parents. And I know that there were things they did. I remember one time we were all enjoying Colorado on a little vacation. And I looked back where we were staying and I just shake my head. I've driven by there a few times. We thought we were living in a palace. Dad went to the latter part of World War II, and when he got out, he was very tired, and he needed some rest, and so we made our first trip to Colorado, one of many now since then. And I look at that little boarding house where we stayed as a family. Man, we were just so happy. We, it was just the coolest thing you ever, you ever seen in your life, and you could walk up this long flight of stairs and see mountains, and we didn't see mountains. And, I mean, we were, we were in wonderland. And now I look back. When all of us said, Dad, can't we stay a few extra days? And I heard him talking to Mom, and he said, we're going to have to make, Joe, going to have to make special arrangements if we do. But they made special arrangements. And so the boys had some more fun. You know, sometimes we look back and we think the world owes us a living. Folks, we need to thank God for every goodness and every grace, every Coca-Cola, every little vacation, every extra day on, on a holiday. I mean, there, there are so many little things in life that we take for granted. We really do. To the extent that we are thankful, we are godly. Also, thankfulness is a virtue. Number three, thankfulness is a virtue of our innermost being. 
Thankfulness is a thing of the heart. It's a grace of God within us. Remember Israel, the thing that got them in trouble over and over again until they wandered and their bones bleached in the wilderness. Anything God did for them, he says, is that all you can do? What else are you going to do for us? God worked miracle after miracle. Thankfulness is a virtue of our innermost being. Thankfulness also is a spirit, just as griping and grumbling and complaining is a spirit. The past few days I've talked to people who gave up everything they had to come to live in America. I've talked to people from Russia. I've talked to people from Colombia. I've talked to people from two other nations that I will not mention that left everything they had, sold what they could sell for what meager money they could get out of it, anything to get out of the oppression, the communism, the dictatorship, the dead-end street that people lived on. They knew that there was no chance for them to have a further education, no chance in other situations for their family to ever be anything or have anything. There are people that left every thread in their life except what they could carry on their person and slip out by night and get out of the country to come to this land that people take so lightly. I know we have sins in this nation. I know we have problems in this nation, and I know America's not perfect, and we've made some mistakes. But there's a reason that America is stronger than any nation on the face of the earth. There's a reason that our military might is stronger than any. You say we're bullies. No, we're not bullies. God has placed us in a situation. And you take Grenada. I still hear certain people of very liberal persuasion saying, we interfered with the independence of the island of Grenada. Yeah, right. Yeah, the Cubans and the Russians had to leave. When we first went down there, you could still hear hand grenades at night and gunshots in the night. But oh, thank God, Reagan had the guts to go in there. And what did it take, five days, four days, seven days, whatever? I mean, they planned it. And they said, well, why didn't you tell the news media? You should have. He said, because we wanted to win it. It was right, and we did it. And today, we've had missionaries there for, what, 21, 22 years, preaching and teaching the gospel. There's a tele. Try putting up a television station in Iraq, honey. Put up a Christian television station. Try putting up your Texaco in Iraq and sell your goods and sell your wares and witness and hand out try. Just try it. Wake up and smell the coffee. Thank God for this nation. Thank God for this church. Thank God for all churches that lift up the name of Jesus. Instead of griping and fussing and complaining about America, we ought to thank God every day of our life that we live in this nation. Not perfect, but thank God it's here. And you know, America is a sending station for missions all over the world. You see, people gave up everything they had to just be able to come and sit like you're sitting now and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ without worrying about being arrested before you get back to your car on the parking lot. My, my. Number five, a spirit of thankfulness opens the windows of heaven. It opens the blessings of God in your life. God will bless people that are thankful. And when we are thankful, I mean, I don't know what what you'd call poor, but the poorest person in this room is wealthy according to the standards of many third world nations. You say, well, I just make so much money. They'd be glad to make any money. Well, my car's broken down. They walk. Yeah. And you just think of the blessing. You say, are you being repetitive? Well, a little bit, doing it on purpose. A spirit of thankfulness opens the windows of heaven. What I'm trying to say is, I need, I want, we need, we want so many things that need to come in place. As a pastor, I I see so many needs. I see so many things, and we still have a journey ahead of us. We're, we're We're not through all this walk after the storm. I mean, It's like being in five building programs at once, the the things we've had to walk through. I thought I'd be able to kick back a little bit at this time of life ministry. I'm working 
harder mentally and <laughs> spiritually and emotionally than ever before. But you know what God says? Be thankful for what you have. I thank God for you. I thank God for your faith. You know, three men that gave of their own vacation time to go help somebody else, their life will never be the same again. I want to help others. I don't want to just be a dead sea. It's just us, 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 us. Focus on your blessings, not your problems. Focus on your blessings. So God wants you to make a list. God wants you to keep a list, and God wants you to add to your list of things that I'm thankful for. God wants you to make a list. Say with me, make a list. Keep a list. And daily add to that list all the things that I have to be thankful for. Are you getting the drift of this message? All of us need to be much more thankful than we are. I thank God for Jesus. Do you know if the whole world could see Jesus, war would be over? If there could be a true revelation of Jesus Christ, the love of God, that's the answer to the misguided friends across the way. What the world needs is Jesus, just a glimpse of him. If they just knew Jesus, instead of wanting to kill everybody, they would want to love everybody. Because for the love of God, you'll lay down your life. I thank God for Jesus. I thank God for the word of God. You know, why is it we just beat our head against the wall and we get so frustrated listening to the news and we read the newspapers? And it's okay to know what's going on to a certain degree, but... There's not much you can do about most of it except pray. And then you pick up this word and you sit down and spend 15 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour and all of a sudden your spiritual batteries are just charged. Just like the morning in the midst of many opportunities years ago when I opened to Isaiah chapter 50 verse 7. For the Lord God will help me. On the way to morning prayer I read the verse for the Lord God will help me. That settles it all right there. I'm not going to be confounded. I'm not going to be ashamed. The Lord God will help me. I thank God for sparing our life. Thank God for sparing your life, those of you that were in the building. People talk to me every week. What about those two women in the power tower? Are they under psychiatric care? Are they involved in 24-hour-a-day counseling? Has it just scarred their psychic, you know, I said, no, they're, they're doing quite well. They just come to church and love the Lord and praise God. Safest place in the world is to be. I think they said we came to pray and God spared our life. Thank God he spared their life. I thank God for my family, my wife, my daughter, both my daughters, precious, my son-in-law, my grandchildren. Hallelujah. Got two of my grandchildren on the front row today. I thank God that my grandchildren are serving Jesus. Thank God for our family, that they love God. Thank God for your encouragement. Thank God for three or four cards we received the last week. I don't feel worthy of the expressions of love that we received there. Well, we send it right back to you. We're part of each other. I thank God for our new school. We could have been completely out of Christian education, but God supernaturally has made a way. I thank God for all the seed that we've been able to plant all over the Metroplex and all over the world. I thank God for that. I thank God for the miracles that I've seen this last week. I have seen God walk into the ultimate ward of intensive care and turn death into life. I've seen that. People as close as you could be to death. And we pray on a Thursday night. We're not the only people that pray, but we were some of those that prayed. And at the very time that we were praying, it was a strategic timing that there was a total turnaround. Thank God for the power of prayer. Thank God for the miracle working power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God for all the seed that we've planted all over the world. And I'm thankful that Jesus is building this church had a few moments this last week, and I, I don't know, I, I thought I had, but I guess I did it in a strong way. I just put this church in the hands of God. I love God. I love church. I love the people of church. But, you know, only God can build the church. 
And you know what God's beginning to do? God's bringing people in that say, this is where God has called me. Now, that's what's going to work. You know, we can have all the little programs and we can put all the little psychological pressures and all the stuff and all the stuff that's going on. But when God sends someone to a church, you know, 39 years ago, God sent us to a church and we're still there. 39 years ago, this Easter, 39 years ago, God sent Joe and I to a church and we're still there today. Just, oh, it's exciting to be where God plants you. I'm thankful for that. Well, let me just, you know, I was reading just this last week to show you how far sometimes our nation has drifted. It was in this month of 1844 that Daniel Webster stood before the U.S. Supreme Court and argued against funding a public school that was hostile to Christianity. Boy, does that sound like the dark ages. Let me start all over again. It was in this month in 1844 that Daniel Webster stood before the U.S. Supreme Court and argued against funding a public school that was hostile to Christianity. The court rendered its unanimous decision declaring, why may not the Bible and especially the New Testament without note or comment be read and taught as a divine revelation in the school? Its general precepts expounded and its evidences explained and its glorious principles of morality inculcated. Think about it. 1844, Daniel Webster. Anyone ever heard the name Webster before? Okay. Stood before the U.S. Supreme Court and argued against funding a public school that was hostile to Christianity. Now, anything goes. The occult goes. Well, and then here's another one. During this part of January 1801, President John Adams appointed John Marshall as Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. Marshall was not only competent in the laws of man, but he was also a strong man of God. He served as an early vice president of the American Bible Society and as an officer in the American Sunday School Union. He also strongly supported religious educations. Adams knew that it was important to have justices who understood both man's laws and God's laws. Ezra 7.25, it goes on to say, instructs appoint judges who know the laws of God. Is that strong? And President Bush has often done this, even though many in the Senate will continue to fight his selections. It is expected that Bush will soon have an opportunity to nominate one or more justices to the Supreme Court. Pray for the president that he will make wise choices before God and man that the Senate will confirm nominations. You know, we've forgotten what this is all about. We've drifted. But praise God, there's churches like this that are not going to drift and we're not going to compromise. The Ten Commandments are on our school walls and the Ten Commandments will never come off of our school walls. I was just thinking of being thankful for small things. John Wampler, he brought some tennis balls and handed them out in a little Muslim village and the played ball with the little children there, and they were so thrilled that someone just right outside the gates of Lighthouse Television. When we came back this year, the balls were a little bit muddy, but they were still there. And he brought back some more colorful tennis balls. And when you gave a child a tennis ball, you would have thought you gave him what would be the biggest gift in the whole wide world. And then especially if you'll play with that child. You see, little is much when God is in it. So what are we saying today? This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. My, my. But, oh, the Word of God said times, perilous times, difficult to deal with, a lot going on at once, a reducing of strength, if possible, the wearing out of the saints. You remember Daniel fainted when he saw our day. Does that tell you something about the day in which we live? Dangerous times, too many voices, too much noise. God's answer? God's answer is if my people, which are called by my name, will pray. You know, praying people are thankful people. Stay with the promises of God. Keep your faith level high by feeding on the promises of God. Remember the first report's not the last report if it's not in agreement with God's word. Oh, that one comes back daily, it seems, in people's lives. Let God's peace rule and reign in your heart. 
Let me just give you a little quick example. Load up, load up, noise, voice, thoughts. Uh, uh. And I mean, we're just about to go down for the count. And all of a sudden, say, wait a minute. Jesus has already taken care of this. I don't have to think these thoughts. These are not the thoughts of God because his peace has been promised to rule in my heart and in my mind. So I think thoughts of victory. I think thoughts of strength. I think thoughts of making it. I think thoughts and believe thoughts that God will make a way where there not only seems to be no way, but that God will make a way where there is no way. The promises of God, and I choose to let, let God's peace rule and reign. I rest in God's love and grace. I rest in God's love and grace. <laughs> you know, there wasn't a thing you could do to get you saved except say yes. You couldn't write a check big enough. You couldn't pull out your credit card. It'd melt. <laughs> All you could do to be born again is do what our precious brother did. You just say yes to Jesus. Yes, Jesus, you be my Savior. You be my Lord. You be the boss. You couldn't earn it. You couldn't barter it. You couldn't buy it. The grace of God. You know, we need to thank God every day. Boy, oh, there's so much I want to be. There's so much I want to do. There's so many things that I do. But I just say, whoa, 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 whoa. Thank God that things are as good as they are. Let's praise God for that. Be ye thankful. Be ye thankful. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. To God be the glory. 